All right, welcome back to another episode of Phoenix Edge. This is an RPG and gaming podcast. My name's Hat. And I'm Eric. And today we are going to be talking about our thoughts thus far with Octopath Traveler since the last episode. But also we're going to be talking about some mobile RPGs that have come out recently or are slated to come out soon. Then also Nintendo has a $100 million lawsuit against uh, a ROM website or technically two ROM websites. So uh, I thought that was kind of interesting news. So we're going to talk about whether or not that was a good idea. And then also the Atari VCS. It's been announced that an individual that helped in the development of the original Xbox, who has been called the architect of the original Xbox, is now working with Atari on their new project or their Atari VCS console. So we're going to talk about whether or not that gets us excited or if this is a step in the right direction, etc. But... Before we get into all of that, let's just jump into our first topic. Eric, how are you feeling with Octopath Traveler thus far? Uh, I, I'm still feeling very positive about it. There, there are some faults to it that I have discovered getting into the Chapter 2 section of all things. And I think you will agree with me here that this game is unforgivingly grind heavy. Yeah, a lot. Dude, I've been doing nothing but grinding for like three days. Uh, same. I like I have 23 hours on my play session right now, and I think about seven or eight of it's been dedicated to grinding. And yeah. I have honestly have been trying to find ways to ease it up. Rather, if I get, uh, I believe his name is Otherian, to steal items or get Tressa to get special deals on items or find money around the place while grinding for money. And it, it's it's a slow process, man. Everything in the markets is so expensive like even if with like good reputation it, yeah. it's and like when i and when i finally do get this stuff like the boss battles that correspond with like the town i am getting the gear from it they're it's an unbelievable hp sponge these bosses it, they're not particularly hard and, and it's easy to manage against them like they're not difficult but they take forever to beat and i am using ideal parties i'm using like the latest and greatest armors and weapons and elements and i can beat them but these bosses have such ridiculous amount of hp that it just yeah. takes forever feeling to well, take them down I mean, see initially i saw some of this criticism on the internet that hey some of these enemies are hp sponges that's what it feels like and my initial reaction was hey no, that's the game incentivizing you to train your other characters because I thought, well, the reason they're HP spongers is because you're not breaking them. But no, I've, I've gotten to the point now where I've, I'm, a, I'm about 35 hours in and dude, I've, I just, I have to grind. There's nothing I can do. I like, and it's just like, it's getting to the point where like, even like, like you said, the equipment is so expensive that like, and it takes hours upon hours, it feels like to get enough money to equip everyone with what they need. And even then, I, like I, you said the bosses aren't, some of the bosses aren't necessarily difficult. They're just HP heavy. I, I would agree with that, but I, I find that I'm still, sometimes I'm stuck in the, the position where I'm just going through like all my items. Cause I think part of the problem is that the game keeps you locked into whatever you first character you chose that character can't be removed out of the party until i saw somewhere like later in the game like late in the game so i wanted to try somebody different than everyone else that that was choosing primrose so i chose alfin as my first character i hate that character <laughs> but he's permanently stuck in my party so i feel like an idiot trying to put any other like uh, i think of Oph ophelia she's the other healer right She's a way better healer, I think, than uh, Alfin is. But the Alfin's primary focus for me anyways thus far has been healing. He, he's got some, like, axe special moves and stuff like that. But, like, he can only heal one character at a time thus far uh, with his skill abilities. So, like, these peop these enemies, they'll just, like, blind my entire party. And then, like, I like Alfin can only, uh, like, fix, like, one of them at a time. So my only other option is to buy enough items to like have everyone individually fix themselves. But then the bosses will just come through and, uh, you know, blind everyone again. So in between dealing with that and 
uh, just dealing with the unbelievable amounts of uh, HP some of these bosses have. Uh, it's dude, it's I've been grinding a lot, but uh, I think I've been not as efficient with my time as I could could have been because uh, since it's so grind heavy, I'm not going to just sit there and grind and look at the same enemies over and over, you know? So I've been trying to, cause it's a switch, it's portable. I'll, I'll uh, watch some YouTube, watch some TV or something while I, while I grind, listen to some podcasts, uh, try to do something else to occupy myself while I'm just, you know, grinding away in the same areas. And, uh, so I think, you know, I've been getting distracted a little bit. Yeah. That's, um, that's essentially so, what I've been doing is just watching stuff on YouTube or, Netflix and just grinding away at it. Now, granted, I have spoken to people who've gotten a lot further than me because so far my progress is I've completed everyone's chapter one and I've def- completed three characters, chapter two. Mm-hmm. And people have told me when you get into further chapters, that money is a lot more accessible. Like people are telling me that like, Oh, I have 200,000 now. And, and like gear just costs way less than that. And I have so much left over. And I'm like, and I'm wondering what, what goes on these later chapters that money's a lot more accessible. (laughs) Uh, You know, maybe, maybe monsters have just a, a lot more gold intake or there's methods, better methods of like stealing or merchant, uh, merchant selling or something like that. And, mm-hmm. and just, you know, the risk, is, uh, the reward is, you know, greater than the risk for it. But right now in chapter two, in the context of chapter two, it does not feel like that. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's very, very, very intense. I've noticed this game. I still, overall, I'm with you. Like I'm still overly positive about this game, but I've noticed also that, uh, some of the design features, it seems like they've pulled a little too much from the past. Uh, you know, like there's all sorts of. Like if you go to play an NES game, like NES RPG all the time, they would have these like little like hallways where you're absolutely convinced if you follow this entire hallway around the corner, there's going to be, you know, a, a treasure or a way out of the cave or whatever and you'll follow this long windy path and then you'll get to the end and realize, nope, it's just a wall. There's no treasure there. Uh, this game does that. And I'm like, dude, that was a design philosophy that should not be brought back. I do not like that. Yeah. You know? Th- this game isn't perfect by any means, but I will say I still have been enjoying it very much. The story of each character I've done so far has piqued a level of interest with me. Not so much Alfin <laughs> like you, but um, for chapter two, I did Primrose, Alberic, and Ophelia's stories, and I enjoyed each one of them. They uh, they're very interesting characters. The uh, situations they're in, especially Primrose, like mm-hmm. her story is just awesome so far. And Alberic's is very interesting. I want to see where it goes with him. There's uh, the point I am in his story, there's a lot more interest and, uh, and, or like, there's more to it. I thought it was going to be kind of like a shallow revenge story, but it's actually building up to something more interesting. And Ophelia is more of like the fun character side so far. It's mm-hmm. like, she's like the kind healer type character who's yeah. out there to help people under the name of the church. And, you know, hers was like a heartwarming type of thing. Sure. And I enjoyed hers also. So, you know, and I still enjoyed the battle system. It's very engaging. And I like how the BP improves itself from variably default system where you feel like you're rewarded for waiting instead mm-hmm. of feeling like you're punished for sure. using up a lot. Yeah, uh, of turns at once. So that's a very nice change of pace for the battle system. So I'm still really enjoying that. I still just my biggest gripe so far really is just the grinding. Yeah. And I, I would agree that I think so far and I'm not going to like someone's freaked out right now. I'm not going to spoil anything, but uh, the story thus far in chapter two, I would say is better than chapter one. I still have some issues with it. I still think some of them could have been done a little bit better. Uh, mainly like situations where I feel like the party should not be there. And it, clearly the party is not there. 
but then suddenly you get in battle and it's like a full party again. It I, like I, I I should be getting used to that, but it just drives me nuts. Um, especially with uh, like Oberic, I feel like some of those battles should have been one on one as opposed to like a whole party. But um, yeah, overall it's 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 getting better on the story front. Uh, I have seen some of the travel banter uh, between the characters, and uh, th- that's nothing to get excited about at all. Um, <laughs> it's it's a it's a nice little touch, but it's not it's not something you necessarily need. But it does bring a little something extra if you've been wanting any kind of interaction between the characters. Mm-hmm. Have you tried? Because have you tried the Japanese audio? Because I've been switching back and forth. I can't decide which one I like better. No, I mean. I, I don't have a level of standard for Japanese audio. So, I mean, I don't speak the language. So mm-hmm. unless it's something like obviously terrible sounding, it's like I can't tell you if the performance of a Japanese audio is great or not. I can only tell you if an English one is good or not. Well, and that's the thing. Some of the like the, the thing with this game is I feel like the voice acting is kind of all over the place. Some characters, it's fantastic. It's very well executed. And then other characters... I just feel is it's just terrible. And generally when I get to those terrible moments, I'm like, okay, I got to put some Japanese audio on. And because I'm just like you, I don't know Japanese. It's hard for me to assess whether it's bad voice acting or not. So I just, my brain is just like, Oh, it sounds good. Um, so that's kind of like my go-to when like the voice acting, like I'm a, I'm in a sp- uh, specific story segment where I feel one character is specifically a, a, like obnoxious. I'm just like, okay, I got to change this up and I just switch it to Japanese. I'm just like, okay, let me do this for a while and I'll switch it back to uh, English once I get through it. So, um, but yeah, I'm with you. I I don't know Japanese, so it's not like I can be a critic of it. I just don't feel like that way generally with most games. There there are rare occasions where I'm like, okay, this English voice acting is just so bad that I got to change it. Like Enchanted Arms, like that game. (laughs) That's such horrendous English voice acting. Like it, it's, it, it's like they just like picked like anyone out in the studio. I'm like, read these lines and be overly dramatic about it. I was like, <laughs> okay, this is a time where I either need to find a Japanese audio or shut off the audio entirely. Yeah. I think one character that's uh, pretty bad for me, which wouldn't be necessarily because of the voice acting, but it would be just because of her mode of speech is uh, I can't ever pronounce her name right, but Hanit or Hanit. Yeah. I, yeah. She's, uh, she's pretty much in my party at all times. Cause she's. Oh, sorry. I thought I heard somebody mm-hmm. uh, coming on the door, but that was my neighbor. Okay. So anyways, she's in my party like almost all the time and uh, it's pretty sick, but. Uh, Does thou haveth a problem with her if? Yeah, but it's like absolutely like terrible. I can't even listen to it because I'm like, that's not like I'm not like an expert on old English, but I just that, that just doesn't sound right. Yeah, it does <laughs> not sound right at all. I'm like, all right, that's not even you're not even trying now. Yeah, it's just like you're just adding these letters on the end of everything. And I'm like, stop saying that. Stop. Just and the stop. weird thing is they're like a tribal hunting village. Like this is yeah. this is not a place where I would think they would use old English. Maybe, maybe there's some history to that that i'm not aware of in real life but like i would think of that of something like in cyrus's story but like but with like the rich aristocrats and stuff like that and mm-hmm. the royal families i would understand that they talked like that but i hate it when games do that because it kills the level of consistency in the world it's okay if you want to put like accents or something right but Nowhere else in the game sounds different or has some weird accent to it. This is the only place so far that I have discovered that has so, this weird uh, mannerism to their speech. Yeah, and I, I feel like if you're going to do that type of stuff, I don't know. I feel like the game should have like the script. Everyone should like talk the same way. But like you said, if they're they're going to do something different to try to like differentiate different parts of the world... They can have like Final Fantasy 12 did with like different uh, accents where like this, like they're still saying the same stuff. They might kind of rearrange it a little bit, um, but like in general, it's the same style. It's just the person speaking with an accent. So you're like, oh, okay, this person's from over here. But uh, I mean, yeah, it's a minor gripe, but like when she's in your party at all times, 
uh, you know, you hear it nonstop and I'm just rolling my eyes constantly. So, yeah, Dragon Quest does this. They, um, you know, like different towns around the world you visit, like Dragon Quest eight. And from what I hear, 11 also, it's like the people in the townsfolk have like different language or like different mannerisms or accents to how they speak. They all, like everyone speaks English, you know, for the localization. But like yeah. every village you went to, they had some kind of unique accent to them that define their, you know, their town and their people. And, you know, that's fine. That's being consistent still with, mm-hmm. with how the world works. It's like, there's different places where people speak, you know, differently for one another. But in this game, it's like everyone speaks normal English except this place. Yeah. So and that's where it feels weird. I don't know. And I guess I can think of games where they've done something similar but it seemed okay. For example, Chrono Trigger with uh, Ayla, she kind of talked like a cave woman, but I mean, it was still very easy to understand and it it matched her, uh, you know, she was that matched her world that she lived in. Right. So um, I guess there are options are times when you can do that correctly, but, and this one, it's kind of odd. So anyways, Mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, overall, I mean, even though we've been kind of acting negative towards it, it's still a fantastic game. I still recommend anyone go pick it up if you're, uh, I mean, if you're a fan of JRPGs, this is definitely like one of the better ones that have come out in a while, just from what I've played so far. And if you're still unsure about it, there's a three hour demo. If you like it, you can transfer that game to the whole thing. I mean, it's still a high recommendation from me. It's still, I think the positives still greatly outweigh the negatives of the game. Yeah. I mean, it's like I said, like it's, it's still, I'm still enjoying it. I still have a good time with it. I've seen a couple of like articles Satan that like, this is a contender for a game of the year and stuff like that. And I don't know about that. That's kind of like getting ahead of yourselves, but I'm having a good time with it. That's what I'm willing to say. You only say that because Dragon Quest 11 is not out yet. (laughs) Yeah. But I don't know, man, even then, like, I feel like really, like if you start thinking about like all the games that have come out thus far, uh, like, is it, is it going to beat? Um, is it going to exceed God of War? I mean, like, uh, you know, I mean, realistically, God of War will probably win game of the year. Yeah. I'm like, Octopath Traveler is not going to do that. I mean, it would be cool if it won something, but it can be a contender for best RPG of the year, but uh, or art, art direction or music or something like that, maybe. But yeah, but sorry, Dragon Quest 11. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm sure. Yeah. Once Dragon Quest 11 comes out, I'm sure that uh, a lot of. A lot of people are going to switch over to that. So, mm-hmm. they better. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, anyways, what was our next topic? Mm, no, well, before I say that, I say that specifically because the more people who get Dragon Quest 11 will motivate Square Enix to bring Dragon Quest 10 over here to the West. So, as a favor to me, everyone watching this, and if you don't care about Dragon Quest, go buy it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> A public service announcement. But uh, yeah, well, speaking of announcements, to the next topic, <laughs> um, we want to talk about the free-to-play mobile uh, scene going on right now. We may have dabbled a little onto it before, but uh, we kind of want to discuss the whole thing about it. And this is in reaction to Sony now coming into the mix with um, coming into the mobile scene. And they are releasing one of their first products that they're going to fully announce on the 30th of this month. And that is one of my favorite RPG series, Arc the Lad. And it's going to get a mobile title. And it is going to be, so far, they say it's going to be free to play. But it will be developed by the people who made the first and second game primarily. So that that is an excitement there, but I know what people are going to say, which is, "Uh oh, it's free to play. You know what's going to happen." <coughs> and I agree, this could totally be a shallow cash grab. I really hope that's not the case. But this is Sony's first foray into the mobile scene, so we can see how it goes. And if it's successful, they said they were also interested in bringing wild arms and wild arms the series and parappa the rapper into the oh, mix. wow i mean <laughs> rapper the I mean, rapper could i had a good time screen. 
Yeah. That, that's a game that does call for a touchscreen interface. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah, that could be a little bit of fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, generally, with mobile games, you, I don't know if you always want the sound up. You know, a lot of times yeah, you're you're at work or something, you have the sound on mute. That might be an odd game to play in that context. But uh, aside from that, you know, bringing Ark the Lad to mobile, I think that's pretty cool. I mean, I don't really like mobile games generally. And it is kind of weird that Sony's getting into that because it's, I don't know, it doesn't, it's not like Sony's in the hardware business. So I'm surprised that Sony's not coming out with a phone of them themselves or, or something along that lines. The fact that they're just releasing their own content on third party uh, phones is surprising to me, but I'm kind of worried this Arc the Lad game is going to have a bunch of uh, stuff in it that we don't like. <laughs> Some yeah, free-to-play nonsense. That, that is definitely my biggest fear, but uh, what I'm guessing is Sony saw the success of Nintendo on mobile, despite Nintendo not primarily making games on the mobile platform, but they're making like like basic mobile games that are based off their franchises. Mm. And they probably see the success of games like Fire Emblem Heroes on there. All right. I don't forget is that what it's called. Fire Emblem Mobile. I'll just call it that. Um, and they're probably saying like, you know, we got some famous franchises that we can try to bring back onto mobile also. And it won't hurt our PlayStation sales at all. You know, it's just there to be there. And if it's successful, we'll just keep doing it. So that, that's another thing that scares me into it being a shallow free to play game is that they may not take it seriously enough and just say, hey, here's something just to get some money, some extra money to the side. Yeah, because I'm kind of curious, like, why don't they, if this game is a serious game, it's going to come out, and I say serious, but I say that, you know, I know, like, that's kind of offensive if you really like free-to-play games. But for me, like, if if this is like a serious standalone game, uh, why is, is, is the game also going to hit the PS4 store? In addition to the mobile mobile store, uh, you know, uh, like that would be my main question, because I know that, you know, the free to play model wouldn't be as viable on the PlayStation 4 store, at least in the same way. You know? Yeah. I mean, I even question if Arc the Lad will even come to the West. I don't remember seeing a confirmation of a Western release, but it may. I mean, we have to wait till the 30th and see. But sure. I mean, this is a that's a series I love. I love the first three games. The fourth game is pretty okay and the fifth game is terrible (laughs) but uh the uh i mean that's a series i enjoy i encourage anyone to play it psn they're all five bucks yeah (laughs) you know try the first one but um that is one that's coming out and speaking of other mobile titles square enix released another free-to-play rpg this time it's uh star ocean and It is exactly like you think it is. And it is a free to play shallow cash grab game that banks on purely on the nostalgia of star ocean player or star ocean fans. However many people those are. And you essentially go on a game board like map and you tap along the way and you just do battles and you get some cutscenes in between like random little cutscenes where you're talking to this little bear robot and another girl that joins you and just some random banter there. And you have the power to summon characters from the five star ocean games. And Uh that's about it. You go across the game board map, you do some star ocean like battles, kind of like it kind of feels like a mixture of star ocean four and five. Like, Uh, Granted, it does look nice presentation wise, like the graphics look really good in the battle. Like it looks like almost as good as the PS3 game. Yeah. Like, again, the the combat feels shallow. You just press abilities and you can just like auto battle, let it win for you. Mm -hmm. So, well, first off, 10 points, if you can pronounce the the entire name correctly. Um. Star Ocean Animanesis? I don't know. <laughs> I need to. I would have to look at the title again. I forgot what that what that type <laughs> it, of name is. It's like what? What's the most like? I don't even it's, know if it's, it's A N A M N E S I S. So I think it's Animanesis. Sure, that that works. <laughs> I was trying to look at it earlier, and I had it down. I'm like, all right, I'm gonna practice this, and then uh, I lost it. So uh, 
That's not good marketing, but. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, what's a really stupid name we can put next to this and make it sound cool? <laughs> yeah. And the missus. <laughs> so, and I don't, yeah. So whatever that means, I'm sure there's some context in the game. I've checked out some videos with it. I haven't actually been able to sit down and try it myself. So uh, that is unfortunate. But the game doesn't look like for as far as m- mobile games, free to play games go. It doesn't look as bad as some of the other ones. Uh, it does seem like they actually put a fair amount of money into it. Like there are, you know, like you said, graphically, it's pretty good for a mobile game. And uh, there is a story with the game and you don't have to buy anything to get through the game. However, I did read that once you get to like the third chapter or whatever, things start getting really tough if you don't pay, but you can, if you sit there, you can grind and uh, get, do what you need to do to uh, get through the game. Um, and it looks like the story is probably going to be developed for a very long time if it succeeds. But um, yeah, it's like you said, it looks like there's an auto battle feature and I've seen some people say that they don't mind the auto battle because you know, they're playing at work or they're, they're doing it while they're on the phone and they don't want something that uh, requires a ton of thought. They want something to just pass the time. And I guess from that perspective, I could understand if you like, you're just passing time and then, you know, you can read the plot synopsis and, and stuff like that. And that can, that could be rewarding in of itself. And I know right now they're giving a bunch of free stuff away if you download it. Um, but yeah, I, it, these, these types of games make me not want to play mobile games. I, I think people actually become more fond of auto battle is because the games, not just star ocean, but a lot of these free to play RPGs that Square Enix releases, they're so monotonous in their their design that it gets to the point where like, okay, I don't feel like really playing this anymore, but I still want to progress. So I'm gonna hit the auto battle button. So how fun is your game truly if people are are getting so bored so quickly that they feel compelled to use the auto battle? Yeah. Well and um... That's the major criticism I've seen with the game, although it has gotten, I, we do need to acknowledge that it has gotten a fair amount of good reviews for mobile games. But uh, the, the criticism I'm saying is like, because, you know, a, a, most of the battles you can fight on auto battle, it becomes more of a stat grind, meaning uh, do you have the correct stats to uh, defeat this enemy? You know, because if you're on auto battle, that's the only thing that's going to determine that. It's not going to be determined by your skill. So uh, it just comes down to how long are you willing to sit there and auto battle as opposed to uh, using the right techniques, acting strategically, uh, you know, a type of combat. So that is an issue with me and mobile gaming in general. The, the thing is that the mobile platform has a lot of potential to it. There are some good games on it. Like there is like the first Final Fantasy Dimensions was pretty good. Chaos Rings 1 through 3 were really good games, I thought. Mm -hmm. Uh, These were not free-to-play games. They were just buy it and you have them type of deal. Final Fantasy Dimensions in particular let you play the first chapter for free. And if you liked it, then you could buy the remaining chapters of the game. Uh, I thought that was a really good setup. And then uh, the other game, I mean, the ports are great. Like the Dragon Quest ports are really awesome. The, The world ends with... You is probably the the definitive version is probably on the iOS, arguably mm-hmm. iOS, Android. I mean, mobile general. But um, I mean, it has potential, I think. And the problem I have with these type of games, it just shows that they're they I'm sorry, they're not willing to take the platform seriously. And when they don't, and they expect us to take it seriously, you know, that's I mean, that that's laughable, right there. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's why sure. the West is so. I mean, I'm sure this is more openly embraced in Japan, but <coughs> sorry. Um, but in the West, it's it's loads mostly, even though there might be a number and amount of people who play it. I mean, the general outlook of it is that a lot of people load these type of titles. And uh, I don't know, maybe it's just some cultural <laughs> um differences here with the mobile titles, but I just don't feel like they take it seriously when it can be taken seriously when you have great games like chaos rings three that came out. Well, and I wonder if perhaps the reason 
one of the reasons, there's lots of reasons why mobile gaming has gone the route it has. Uh, maybe one of the reasons it was ca- like Chaos Rings has not succeeded as well as some of the others is simply because uh, having a game like that being able to run on uh, all sorts of different types of phones, like maybe just the fact that you would const- they're constantly getting compatibility issues and maybe just having uh, you know people constantly updating that and patching that and working out bugs, if perhaps that was not seen as profitable compared to uh, other games where they have those systems in place and you can sit there and pay. Now, none of that might be true. I'm just taking a stab at one possible reason. Uh, that might not be an issue at all. So perhaps uh-huh. if somebody's really knowledgeable about mobile development, they can kind of clarify that in the comments. But uh, that's one thing I'm thinking. I don't know. More well, of the games recently have required higher level phones for mm-hmm. higher model phones to take it. And I'm going to do something crazy here. This is not everyday people. So, you know, take what you can get from it because you don't hear Eric compliment Final Fantasy 15 very often. And that <laughs> is the Final Fantasy 15 Pocket Edition, despite it may being a little overpriced, was still a great model that they came up with. It's they let you play the first chapter for free. And if you liked it, it let you buy the rest and yeah. you ch- and you got the entire game, nothing holding you back. It's like you play from start to end. You got the full game and it's it's not the worst game I played on it. It still has the story issues of um, and we've talked about it before, but to, to sure. just in short, like this, it still has all the story problems, but the gameplay was OK. It you was I- it was built specifically for mobile devices to combat. Mm-hmm. And I can appreciate that they took the time to make sure that this was something that was made for a mobile platform device, not simply try to simulate the actual FF15 combat with like a virtual controller or something. You know what I like about that game is that they give the first chapter away for free. I think that's really, really important because a lot of times when I look at games in the mobile store, I'm tempted to give them a purchase, but I'm like, oh man, am I, do I have enough memory for this? Like, or is this going to run on my phone? I see some negative comments that say it didn't really run too well on their phone. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure if my phone version, if it's going to run well, last thing I want to do is buy it. And then like, I have to like start uninstalling a bunch of crap and then like, it doesn't run well. And then like, I can't really play it. Like this, this sounds like, a, like a lot. I'm just not going to buy it. Whereas with, you know, Final Fantasy 15 on the phone, they let you just download the first chapter for free. So there's not really much to lose for you to just try the first chapter. And like you said, you didn't like it. You didn't have to buy a second chapter. So I think that is a good model. And, you know, yeah, it still has the issues of the main game uh, that we've addressed before. But I mean, that aside, I mean, if they could kind of follow that model with other games, I think that would be really, really uh Good thing for the good thing for them to do because realistically at that point people are not going to buy another chapter unless you're still bringing content that they want right as opposed to just playing with people's emotions and making them buy like five extra gems so they can see their name on a stat board or something like that you know it's just it's I don't know, it's it's just a different uh, service model and I think that that route would be much more. Um, trustworthy and just uh, general it would be a good investment with uh, the consumer base for square games so um yeah, yeah i agree with that yeah i mean definitely i mean yeah you know, you're you're right on the point and the thing with the free-to-play games is uh, n- another thing that drives me crazy with those is that they feel so accessible they like just throw everything at you like i don't have a, like a drug dealer gives you like a taste of the drug to get you addicted <laughs> and then you want to yeah. come back and they make you pay for it I yeah. really feel like this is kind of the same setup here where <laughs> they they want you to just keep, keep coming back for more and more. And uh, granted, it doesn't work on most people. This really works on people who have a lot of money to spend and have addictive qualities to uh, buy a lot of things. I mean, it's definitely OK if you spend like maybe like 20 or 30 dollars overall in the game. 
something. If it's something you sure. truly enjoy and you feel like you want to invest money, little money into it, that's cool. But there are people who put like hundreds among hundreds of dollars into one game. And I really don't think they're getting much for it, especially since how RNG these systems are. And I mean, that, that's the that's the people that they really aim for at the end of the well, day are the people who are putting hundreds of dollars you, into it. Oh, I mean, if you look at something comparative uh, uh, that you can compare it to, which I think is a good analogy is Las Vegas, right? Um, they make the most of those casinos, they make like 50 to 60 percent of their income off just 5 percent of the people that visit their casinos. Right. Because those people come in there and they start betting these outrageous amounts where they sit in there all day and just drain their entire wallet. And uh, that's where they make most of their money off of. And it's a very small percentage of the people that actually visit Las Vegas, uh, specifically the Strip. So if you compare that to this mobile market, it's the same thing. It's, you know, you and me, we're not making them much money. Even if we spend a dollar buying something like an upgrade or something, like it's not going to make them, uh, they're not going to be over the moon. It's the people that go on there and they'll spend two or three hundred dollars a month <laughs> on the game. You know, that one person is paying for like 12 people, you know, uh, it's, so it's, it's hard to compete with that and get them to do anything else. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I remember I watched a, um, review slash kind of scathing rant from, uh, final fantasy peasant with his review on, uh, the final fantasy 15, a new empire mobile game. Um, and he said that somebody he talked to spent $900 and one mm-hmm. day to get like, like all the resources and like to be like their name on the scoreboard. And that person was not even ranked number one after spending $900. They're ranked sixth on the scoreboard for that game. And then when that person woke up the next day, they are scored at like 115th and they spent $900 in a day. Like, like it's not like, I can't, I know you can't compare that experience to the star ocean experience uh, it might not be that bad, but it's just like, I don't know, man. I just don't like that type of stuff in these games. So that, that is just gross. $900. Jeez. Yeah. If you spend that, $900, you should, either. you should be number one for like eternity. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, I mean, if somebody donated, like we're, we don't, uh, we're not like, we don't have a Patreon or anything, but, uh, if somebody like randomly donated $900 to us, Dude, your name would be in like the co- like the freaking end of every podcast. Like, thank you, this person, for like the next five years. Uh, <laughs> that's just an obscene amount of money. So, it's I mean, I mean there's sure. no game out there that's so good that I'd be willing to just straight out give nine hundred dollars to them. Uh, maybe Final Fantasy Nine, but that's it. Uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> not even nine, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll buy, I'll buy another version if they come out with it, but that's it. So. Um, but yeah, so we got those games, uh, we got, uh, Ark the Lad that's supposed to come out on July 3rd, or not July 30th. We're supposed to get another details, details right. regarding mm-hmm. it. So hopefully they'll announce an English version because we don't know Japanese and I've tried to play to, there was a game recently or it came out last year. I think it was called another Eden or something like that. But it was made by one of the people that worked on Chrono Trigger. It was supposed to be a spiritual successor, but an actual spiritual spiritual successor. It had a great soundtrack. Uh, I looked at the gameplay. It seemed to be really, really fun. And uh, somebody gave me a link to play it in Japanese, which is the only way it came out. And yeah, trying to play through an RPG in Japanese is not very fun. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> I, I heard about that too. And I'm actually looking forward to that. I mean, uh, a certain friend of ours has been hyping it. To, yeah. He hyped it a lot when it first came out. And I mean, from the gameplay, I, I didn't understand what they were saying, but the gameplay looked pretty fun. But I'm not exactly sure how the free to play model works on it or how it'll work for the West. Because sometimes they give us a different model than the Japanese do in terms yeah. of uh, free to play structure. Like Mobius Final Fantasy, they got. Um, you just grind for the crystals and um, you can grind for the crystals all day you want. But in the Western version that you have, you couldn't grind for them. I think you can now, but back then 
you had to wait a certain period uh, and then you could hit a button after a time has come by and it would give you a hundred crystals instead of grinding for them. Hmm. So that they do. So it's just a lot of, change the yeah. model. I don't know. We'll have to see, uh, you know, I've still at this point, I'm not big on mobile gaming, uh, aside from downloading an emulator on my Android phone. And then I got every PlayStation and super Nintendo game <laughs> at my fingertips. But, uh, aside from that, um, you know, I'm not really into mobile gaming. So, um, but I'm always open to see maybe something will change my mind, you know? So, yeah, I mean, I would love them to take the mobile platform seriously. I mean, it, it has great potential. I think as long as you build a game from the ground up to be a mo like be for a mobile interface, not try to simulate another interface that's clearly better for a controller. If you do that and you make it a fair model like the FF15 Pocket Edition or Final Fantasy Dimensions, I think this is a pretty solid route. And if you're if the quality of the product speaks out, people will come buy it. Yeah, exactly. So word of mouth is very powerful nowadays yeah if it's fun to play that's all that it requires so um yeah exactly um speaking of easeability and accessibility though oh nice segment i know <laughs> nintendo uh they've recently filed a lawsuit against uh let me pull the article up here against two websites for copyright and piracy infringement, um, totaling a hundred million dollars for uh, two websites, loverom.com and loveretro.co. So basically, um, this isn't the first time they've done something similar to this, but this is the biggest way they've done it. A couple of years ago, they took the website uh, EMU Paradise. I, th I guess that's MU Paradise. No, yeah, uh, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, they took them on to try to get them to, uh, I don't know exactly what they did, but essentially the result of whatever, whatever kind of legal battle they took to them, uh, the website just kind of re, uh, structured their website and removed a lot of the Nintendo ROMs, not super Nintendo ROMs, not, not, you know, stuff from that system, just games that were Nintendo owned. So, uh, things like, um, Mario, um, I think you said like Metroid games were, they're pretty hard to come on, uh, come across Pokemon games. Um, a lot of that type of stuff, it was very difficult to find for a while. Um, so that was then now, uh, Nintendo's done this hundred million dollar lawsuit. Um, one of the biggest things is love Um, I'm clicking on an image here. Let me make sure I got this up. Okay. Uh, you can't currently go to their website anymore because it's down because there's pending a hundred million dollar lawsuit. Mm -hmm. So they just took their website down for good reason. But the way the graphical setup was before it, the background was all Mario. And then like all the links were like for the home button was like the tube that Mario goes down. And then the ROM button was like a little mushroom and like everything was like stuff that was identified with uh, Nintendo products or Nintendo games. And mm -hmm. so that's one thing that Nintendo hit uh, love ROMs with was, Hey, you're infringing on our stuff um, because you're selling advertisement on this website and you're, you have all of our imagery on your website. I think that's a very real thing. And I feel, I feel like that was a very dumb of love ROMs to do, especially when I found out this website was based in Arizona. A lot of times some of these websites they will be based in like a, a nation that it's kind of hard to, uh, you know, legally get them to pull it down. But dude, if you're based in the United States, like that, that, that was a dumb idea. Um, so on that front, I totally agree with Nintendo. Uh, they, uh, you know, but also just basically a hundred million dollars, you know, they don't have a hundred million dollars. You're trying to shut the website down. And I just don't think, I don't agree with this decision to, go after them in this hard of a way. I know they have every right to, I know they own the games, but like the whole idea behind this is that, uh, Nintendo believes that if people can go download ROMs and they decide to start selling a lot of these games on the switch, that people are not going to buy that on the switch or whatever console, because you can go download the ROM. 
for free. I don't agree with that. I think Nintendo has actually benefited from uh, emulation in general. I, I know it's hurt them, but I think they've benefited greatly off of it. Yeah. I think a lot. I think a lot of people have played games they would have never had a chance to. And like, I just don't agree with that sentiment. And I think that this is just really bad publicity for them. Go ahead. Okay. So the the way I see it, first off, you're right. Nintendo has every legal right to pursue this. I mean, they're legally not in the wrong here at all. What I think they're doing, I'm not saying this is what they're doing, but I've seen this happen before plenty of times. I used to be big on the emulation and ROM scene when I was a teenager, and I just see stuff get shut down all the time or things taken away. You had to go by other means for it. But essentially, I think what Nintendo is doing is a big scare tactic. And I don't think they realistically want a hundred million dollars from these two websites. Sure. These two websites don't have anywhere near that much money to give. <laughs> so yeah, no. it's mostly a scare tactic. I think that is something that get, they're likely going to settle out of court and Nintendo is going to be like, you shut it down and you don't use any of our assets ever again. in whatever website you build next and we will drop the lawsuit. I think that's the approach they're going. Getting a hundred million is unrealistic. Yeah. So, I mean, that's just what it sounds like to me. I think they're just scaring these ROM sites into doing it. And I think it's gone public kind of as a message for other emulation websites. Be like, watch out. Nintendo might come for you next. Yeah. And I think that, I think you're right there. Like, obviously these two websites don't have that much money. And uh, they're either like Nintendo's like basically put them in the position where they're saying, hey, either shut your website down entirely or remove all of our stuff. You know, that's that's the two things that's going to happen out of this. Um, I just mm, I don't know. I, it's it's so hard for me because on one hand, I can understand like if I was a company and I had my own games, it would kind of irritate me that websites were just giving away my games for free. But at the same time, Nintendo, like you've kind of let this go on like for so long, like it's, and I know they've taken a little bit of action in the past, but it's just, it's, it's got to the point where like, no matter what Nintendo does, you're never going to be able to like cleanse the internet of ROMs. You know, the Nintendo ROMs are always going to exist. You're always going to be able to get them somewhere. Uh, it, it does not affect the sales. In fact, it only helps you because uh, look at the SNES classic. You know, you could go download all those ROMs for free and that, that system still did great. The NES Classic did great. Um, you know, if you released, re-released any Nintendo game on the Switch tomorrow, it would still do really well despite the fact that you could go download it. So I don't agree with this idea that like it's it's actually been hurting hurting them at all. I understand they got to do something every now and again. To, like just keep the record out there that they have a problem with it. Yeah, I highly doubt that these are hurting their sales at all. Especially since you can't even get a hold of an NES or NES, SNES Classic, goes to show that their stuff sells just fine. When something goes on their virtual console, it sells great. People do want to play these on these systems. They're willing to pay for it, and people have been just begging Nintendo to release some kind of virtual console, put GameCube games on the Switch, yeah. and stuff like that. People are begging for it. The, the, the piracy level, I highly doubt, has an effect to the point that Nintendo has to take such drastic action for it. Now, granted, the DS era was very... What's the best way to put this? Very awful on their side, because pirating a DS was so easy... That you could just buy a like twenty dollar cart from someone and put an SD card in it and put it in, and it would basically run. Yeah, and you could play all the games on. I mean, piracy was that bad, and even casual customers knew about it. So <laughs> then they bought it. I mean, I had one for myself because you know I couldn't afford anything at the time. It's you know, sure. I, I, so I got one of those, obviously. But I mean, I don't obviously don't own one <laughs> anymore. I mean, I, I buy everything I get now, but. Um, I'm not against emulation either if people are thinking that, but, uh, it was so easily accessible that, uh, like even someone I worked with, like just had one and they're not gamers at all. They, they just heard you could get this for free. 
like all these games. And I, I understand on that end that Nintendo really had to take action towards it. But these are games that have not they haven't made any sales from in years. Like I, I understand like that's like the virtual console version of the game you're making sales from. You're you're not making a sale from the actual Super Nintendo cart anymore. Yeah, they're digital sales. And honestly, this is it's so weird because Nintendo is so innovative. They're always coming up with like new ideas and they're finding a new market within an old market. That's what they did with the Switch. That's what they did with the Wii. They're very forward thinking. But when it comes to this type of stuff, they're just behind the curve. I mean, even with like YouTube, like they're the notoriously bad about, uh, you know, <laughs> taking other videos down or demonetizing the crap out of it. I mean, they're just really bad with this type of stuff. So this seems to me like instead of uh, following the trend of the market and seeing like, oh, this is what this is the way consumers prefer to play our games. Let's find a way to make money on it. As in, uh, I don't know, coming out with a virtual console on the switch and letting people actually buy these games, you know, like instead of like going with the market and just making it much easier to do this, they're instead just like, no, we're not going to sell it and we're not going to let other people play the game either. Like, it just doesn't make any sense to me. You know, you know, you know, it's another way to lower piracy. Uh, hypothetically, if this was an issue, hmm. how about not make a game like Balloon Fighter five bucks when it's clearly a like 99 cent game at this <laughs> point? I mean, it's a classic game. Don't get me wrong. Just Balloon Fighter is not a five dollar game. It's a 99 cent game. It's something you just play real quick and, you know, then you just go about your day. It's I mean, yeah. the, the you can find games that are like Balloon Fighter on mobile that are like free to 99 cents that people are selling it for. It's, you know, I mean, you can make like your nicer games like Super Mario Bros and Zelda, maybe like maybe five bucks or less. Or like not even that, just a little cheaper than that. You know, people would be more open to buying them on that platform. Sure, I mean that's the thing. You gotta you gotta price it correctly, and the, the other thing is you gotta make it available. And if you do those two things, price it correctly and make it available, you're gonna make money off of it. Uh, you know, the, the fact that, like we said, the SNES and the NES classics sold so well. If you look at the demographic of the people that were buying the system. Yeah. There's a lot of people that were buying it because they were nostalgic about it when they were kids, but most of the people buying, you know, the NES classic were not in their forties and fifties. It was a lot of kids, a lot of teenagers, a lot of people in their twenties, and they weren't even around when that system was out. So why are they buying the NES classic? Well, they're nostalgic about your games. Why are they nostalgic about your games? Probably because they emulated it. <laughs> you know, I'm sure that they, they had other options to play the games as well. Uh, maybe they just played it with an older sibling, but I'm just saying there's a certain, there's a certain amount of, there's a certain amount of evidence there to be said that, you know, they've made money off this in some way. Um, and I, I really, I, obviously it's not controlled. It's probably not the way they prefer, but uh, for them to act like they're losing money is preposterous. Emulation has been around since like the late nineties or late two thousands. Yeah. And I don't see Nintendo ever losing so many sales from piracy. I mean, like even I could understand if it was. Things, there I could understand if it was. Sorry, I was gonna say I could understand if it was current games. Oh yeah, I mean, if it's a current game and they're making sales off of it still, like say they release Smash Bros. and then people are banking off Smash Bros. or even Breath of the Wild. Uh, yeah, people hack the Wii U version, mm -hmm. and like they can emulate that. Now I'm against that personally. I mean, because yeah, that, that game's game, currently for sale. Yeah, that game is for sale. That's their product. You know, they're still making money off of it. And you just went ahead and got a free copy of it. That I'm not for. If it's a game that's not being sold anymore, if they're not making money off that particular format of the game anymore, I say it's, then I say it's free game for the emulation scene. Like the Super Nintendo games and the NES games of old. I mean, they're not making money off Super Mario World, the Nintendo Super Nintendo cartridge. They may be now if someone is emulating the virtual console 
version of Super Mario World. I may have a problem with that. Yeah. But most people are not doing that. They're just downloading the Super Nintendo version. It's much easier. Yeah, and there's like <clears throat> there's a variety of things. Like the experience with emulating a game, honestly, is different too than generally when you buy a ported game, right? Uh, there's all sorts of options to uh, tweak the graphics to your liking. You can tweak the sound. Uh, sometimes there's like fan translations you can put in there. Um, you can use your own, your own, whatever kind of controller you want. Like there's a lot of options that you tend to not have uh, when they re-release a game. Um, so, I mean, it is a different experience, but even then, like it's shown that when they release these games, that people are still willing to buy it because like, for example, even though I could uh, play um any uh, Nintendo old school and Nintendo game on my computer right now in 10 minutes, I'm sure I could find the ROM somewhere, even though they've done, done all this action. I'm sure I could find it somewhere. Uh, it would be way cooler to play uh, Zelda link to the past on the switch. Yeah. Wouldn't it? Yeah. It would, like that's something I can't switch. currently do. So there's still a market for them to do that. So uh, yeah, I mean, and I don't, I'm not saying that Nintendo should have a public policy that says like they come out and say, okay, we don't have a problem with emulation. Go ahead. Obviously as a company, you can't say that, but they should just like kind of have a statement on their website. Like they do that says, Hey, we don't support this. And then just like, kind of like leave it alone. You know? Um, yeah. I mean, <laughs> unless it's like actually interfering with a sale of another product, I don't think they should openly attack people. I mean, I think they can just give like a, like a season and desist and just say, Hey, we notice our games are on your website. Just take them down for us. And there'll be no trouble. And if they do that, then, you know, uh, you know, ever like Nintendo walks home happy and the people who put it up are not in trouble. And I mean, and if they continue to keep putting it up, then I think Nintendo's in the right more in the, like on the morality level, <laughs> Nintendo's yeah. more in the right to, um, bring the legal threats to them but um i mean I, I think most of these cases can be settled definitely out of court not a hundred million dollar lawsuit yeah, it's a little ridiculous mm -hmm. uh, not not to mention i was doing some research on this and, and evidently uh, it's been pretty much proven that the uh wii version let's see here uh the wii version of super mario brothers on the virtual console like People, the NES one? Uh, it just says Super Mario Brothers using the virtual console. So I'm assuming... I don't know. Uh, let's just say the NES one. <laughs> okay, let's just yeah. say that because it's hard for me to tell. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think right here it says NES. So anyways... Uh, apparently, uh, there are people uh, hacked into the, the virtual console version and they looked at the coding... And they, there, I guess there's a little fingerprint you can kind of tell tell on there to see where it actually came from, and uh, they're able to show that uh, Nintendo, they're ninety percent certain, just downloaded the ROM and <laughs> sold it on the virtual console. Um, so did they of, sue themselves for a hundred million? Yeah, instead of well, instead of going through the effort of uh, pulling it off like a cartridge and everything like that, they're just like, oh, I'm just going to go right here and download it. And, uh, you know, they made some updates or whatever to it, but that's, that's really funny that, uh, <laughs> they just went to a site and downloaded it. Um, that's hilarious. You know, Nintendo, so. you could do the same thing for mother three. Someone made a really nice translation of it. You can just take that <laughs> and put on your virtual console. Mm, let's go. We got they some ideas here. They even openly said you could have it to people who did it. <laughs> so there you go. Maybe that's an idea out there, Nintendo. If you're listening, if you're, if you're one of those people that are disliking our video right now. At least take that. Let, at least take that uh, idea with you. No, nah, Nintendo loves me too much. They wouldn't do that. Yeah, you, well, you are a big promoter of Nintendo. Yes, I, I am. That. <laughs> so, but um, yeah. Hopefully, uh, hopefully those websites don't go completely under. Hopefully, they still keep providing ROMs. And what's crazy about that? I was going to end the topic there, but it just occurred to me. You know, Sony does like does not care at all. It seems like. You can like Sony games, like they just like I find them all over the place. Like no one, like I've never heard of a a lawsuit or anything. It seems like Sony just is like whatever. We don't care. Oh, 
um, on their current stuff they do. Like I remember. Oh yeah, their PlayStation. What are you talking about? Like current, like generation games, like PS4 games. Yeah, but like. Well, I could see that. Yeah, but during the like PS- as far as I'm PS1 sorry? games, I'm I'm speaking more along like PS1 games. Yeah, but even in like back during the PS1 days, like there's actually uh, a company who found a legal loophole. Oh blip or whatever yeah and released a disc that let you play I own that, yeah like ps1 roms well that was a different thing because like that company was actually selling that and it like it was selling it on the same aisle as sony playstation so it was like hey spend 150 dollars on a playstation or buy this program for 30 dollars and so so of course i saw that as like obviously sony's gonna come in and uh you know be like, no, you're not doing this. This is obnoxious. But as far as like downloading games, like I've I never seen an issue. I know they've had an issue in the past where you could used to be able to burn games and then play them on your PlayStation, or you could kind of like hack your PlayStation. They didn't really like that. Mm-hmm. But as far as like actually downloading ROMs, like they don't seem to care that much. They were they're fighting against people who are uh pirate or uh modding PSPs. Mm-hmm. They were getting up on those because uh, and mm-hmm. sites that were like hosting like um, like emulations for PS uh, PSP, even though, like for stuff that's not pertaining to Sony or anything. They've had trouble like that. Uh, but all that all that stuff seems much more reasonable, uh, whether it be someone actually selling a program next to your your console. <laughs> you know, like that seems reasonable or, uh, you know, a site that's currently putting like games up on a website that is currently for sale. That makes sense to me that you would go after them because, you know, that's currently for sale. Like it's current, your current market. But um, I don't know. It's just kind of interesting. Maybe, maybe if I Google it, maybe I can see some further action from Sony, but I haven't heard anything. So yeah, Sony has had its moments here and there, but they're not, so hard on games that they don't care about anymore. Yeah. Uh, I think if someone is like downloading the ROM to like Jack and Daxter or Crash Bandicoot, one of like the PS1, PS2 era, I don't really think they care. Yeah, I don't think they care either. And if anything, you know, go buy the remastered version. So, yeah. Anyways. <laughs> Um, so that's that. Uh, very interesting. But uh, moving on, the Atari VCS. Um, I'm going to pull up this article here. And we'll just go through it. So let's see here. So it says the Atari VCS hires original Xbox system architect Rob Wyatt. So basically, uh, let me just read this. It's short. Atari has announced that Rob Wyatt system architect for the original Xbox console has joined the Atari VCS team. Wyatt, CEO of 10 Giant, is now collaborating with Atari, AMD, and others in developing and launching the Atari VCS console next year. The announcement of the Atari VCS took us all by surprise. Retro-inspired, but not an exclusively retro gaming machine, Atari has promised a fully modern gaming experience with all the media and streaming options you'd come to expect from your average current generation console. It's seen a lot of support, too, with AMD making a custom processor for the console and over 11,000 backers throwing their money at the console's Indiegogo campaign. And now, original Xbox system architect has thrown his hat in the ring, too. Who wouldn't want to be part of bringing Atari back, said Wyatt. Me. I added that in there. (laughs) From the moment the AMD team introduced me to Atari and the VCS project, I've been intrigued and inspired by the opportunity that it represents, the unique open platform and modern approach that Atari is taking will let users enjoy a broad range of new and existing games and other entertainment while also delivering some unique options to customize the platform to their own tastes by combining additional software and classic content all in one place. This company 10 giant has been working on the Atari VCS's hardware and operating system for a few months now. And Atari is excited to finally and officially announce our partnership said Michael Erzert. I don't know how to say his last name. Atari, uh, CEO of Connected Devices. We have made a commitment to our Atari fans to make the VCS the very best game and home entertainment platform it can be. Rob and his experienced team are working to squeeze every possible ounce of performance out of the Atari VCS hardware, etc. Um, so, and this is from uh, game, uh, GameRevolution.com, or game, yeah, GameRevolution.com, uh, article titled, Atari VCS Hires Original Xbox System Architect, Rob Wyatt. Um, Man, just... 
like I said last time, there's still all words and no action. Well, the, apparently one of the changes that this guy has come on to make is he kind of said, I, there's an interview basically with him. Uh, I couldn't find the original one, but he sat down and said, Hey, you know, I looked at this and the market they're trying to compete in, they're trying to compete in the do whatever you want market, right? That's what, that's what's supposed to be unique about the Atari as opposed to other consoles. So there's a couple of different changes I would make. First thing he did was he said, okay, the Ram is currently four gigs. This needs to be eight gigs. If you expect people to be able to do anything they want, they're going to get creative. Four gigs is not enough. Let's do eight gigs. Um, he also made it available. He said it needs to be available, the full Ram, whereas a lot of systems, like it'll say, oh, it has this much Ram, but you know, a third of the Ram is always reserved for the operating system itself. And so the games can never use the full RAM. It can only use, you know, whatever's left over. Um, whereas the Atari is saying like, no, we're going to make everything available. Um, so those are kind of like some two changes that I think are a positive uh, move forward. Uh, and it's still going to be the same price, but I mean, I got to see some games, dude. I have to see some games. Can you show me some games? I can't take this seriously. Sure. That's a interesting addition to your group for sure. And I'm sure he may going to be pointing out the obvious cuts. I mean, that's very obvious <laughs> at this point. You, sh- yeah. if you, like you said, if you do want to get creative, you do got to give people that eight gigabytes mm-hmm. uh, space for it. And I feel like he's just opening the thing. And he's like, Oh man, <laughs> like, there's so many things in here. You got to change, man. First off, you need to make the thing a big giant X. <laughs> <laughs> it needs to be green. Um, no. you know. <laughs> uh, I, I'm just kidding on that part, but yeah, uh, I, I'm sure he's just looking at it and he's just like, like, man, this thing needs a makeover. It needs a better motherboard. It needs a, needs a solid state drive in here. It needs, I mean, <laughs> I have a feeling the things he's going to recommend, they're probably going to be like, that's not in the budget, not in the budget, not in the budget. <laughs> yeah. And well, and I saw somebody asked him, uh, about the processor, like, Hey, the processor you're using, it's, it's good. But like, why don't you go with some of these other ones that are better? And uh, he did point out that, Hey, like you are right. Some of these ones are better, but we're trying to keep this system within a price range. And uh, this is the best bang for your buck. So, um, I mean, you're probably right. He probably did open that up and he's like, Oh, what's the budget again? Oh, you're not, you're not Microsoft. You don't have $2 billion to spend on this. Um, hmm. <laughs> this limits my choices a bit. Hmm. Okay, well, let me open up my my laptop and see what <laughs> what <laughs> what this is ran with, and let's kind of uh, use this as a model. I, I'm just joking about that, but man, until this thing comes out with some games, I, I just keep, there's nothing for me to get excited about. Uh, I think it's cool that like they're going this route where you know people could be creative and uh, make their own games or whatever the case may be. Uh, maybe a lot of indie developers could get their game on the Atari VCS. That could be cool. You know, like if you can't get your game on steam for some reason, or it is on steam, having it as another option on the Atari VCS, people can play it in their living room. If they can't get it on the PS4 store or the switch or whatever, uh, you know, that's really, really cool. Uh, I mean, I could see a bunch of, if maybe some RPG maker ga- games on there, you know, you could have, you could play all these, really small scale games made by one person. Like there could be a market for that, but I'm not going to buy the system until I see some games. Um, you know, it's like I'm not buying it. And with the promise that, you know, there's going to be some games later, uh, people are going to be, are going to be getting this console, uh, about a year from now, a little less than a year. You should be announcing games. Like we should at least have a few announcements like, Oh, this one's coming up. This one's in development. It's, there's, I don't think there's any games for this, to be honest. So, I mean, yeah, there might be nothing to show. And it makes me wonder also, how bad a condition were they with the system before they had to go out of their way to get a credible person on the team for it? It's Yeah, I mean, well, it probably would have been cheaper for them to have this guy on board the whole time. Yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> From the I, I have a feeling the hardware... Or like the way the hardware was set up, it's just like nowhere near near the ideal type of system that they wanted to go for and what they wanted to sell. 
I mean, that just makes me worry about the product even more, or even more skeptical of buying the product is that like they didn't have the means to make a good system before. So they had to get this guy on board to show them how it's done. Yeah. So I don't know. I think it's, it's a good sign that they spent the money to hire this person. Um, obviously he's credible, uh, has had some success in the past. I think he'll make the system better, but I don't know, maybe, uh, too little, too late, you know? Yeah. I mean, th- this is going the way of the, <laughs> I mean, it just seems like the next, oh yeah, for me. Sure. So it's, uh, it's something that I'm going to keep following here and, you know, we'll keep updating y'all. I'm, but I was surprised and I got to do good, do give, uh, Atari kudos that, uh, they spent some money on it and, uh, hopefully, hopefully it proves us wrong. And, uh, maybe, maybe a year and a half from now, you'll be, you'll see me and Eric talking about some, uh, crazy new RPG mm-hmm. or Final Fantasy 16 that's been released on the Atari VCS. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I never truly ever wish for failure from someone. I mean, I, I, I'm hope I'm wrong. I hope they succeed and I'm wrong. And everyone in the comments are going to be like, ha Eric got it all wrong. But, uh, but you know, I'm glad if people will tell me that because I, I do want to see them succeed. It's just everything. They just, everything they've just been doing so far has just been making me think, Oh, there's, uh, there's no way this will ever like truly take off. But well, like I, I said, underst- I'm open to be wrong. Yeah. Well, I don't understand what, the systems bringing to the table that I wouldn't get from just plugging my PC with an HDMI cable into my TV. Like, I don't understand what's the difference. I mean, you could say that gaming has kind of gotten to that route where like these consoles are basically like, you know, PCs or whatever, but like every console has brought something that you can't find on the PC. Yes. The PlayStation four, like, you could say is kind of like a gaming PC, but the Sony brings a lot of uh, third party contracts to the table games. You can only find exclusively on the system, a very snazzy interface. They have a whole back catalogs of previous games that you can only find on the Sony PlayStation, the switch. It's got its unique aspect where you can pick it up off the TV and you can go portable. Then you can go back to it. They got a bunch of games that you can only find on the switch. Even the Xbox has its perks. The Atari VCS, if you ain't got no games and it's not portable and like, like, I'm just like, it seems to me like I could just go buy a PC at Office Depot and just plug an HDMI cable into my TV and, <laughs> you know, it would yeah. be a similar experience. So, and at, at the very least I would have Microsoft windows on there so I could play any game I wanted, you know? So it's, uh, but yeah, so hopefully over this next year, we learn some more stuff. Yeah, I mean, consoles with first-party title exclusives alone is what makes those systems desirable over a PC. (laughs) I mean, that that and the third-party exclusives they get also on there. I mean, PC is becoming a lot more accessible, and they're making uh, PC a viable platform more and more every year. But... You know, the first party exclusives are always there. People want to play their Mario and Zelda from Nintendo. They want to play their Uncharted from Sony. They want to play their Halo from Xbox. You know, what does Atari have that says, I got to get an Atari so I can make sure I can play this game series? Yeah, and you can find all these games on other systems too. So Mm -hmm. um, (laughs) that's the other problem. But uh, anyways... Um, I don't really have too many other thoughts on that. Do you? Mm, no, not really. It's pretty much the same thoughts as before. Cool. Um, so that kind of wraps up our topics. Let's go ahead and hit some of these comments real quick. Let's see here. Let me see if I got it up. Um, so Jam Gamecast, he kind of posted, he said, thanks again for having me on the show. I really enjoyed our discussion. Um so yeah, thanks Matt for coming on last week. It was a lot of fun. We had a, a lot of really good topics. If y'all haven't checked out his channel, Jam Gamecast, go ahead and uh, check that out. Uh, just type Jam Gamecast in the YouTube and it should come right up. And he, he's got some good stuff on there. And uh, check out our last episode. It was uh, really cool to have uh, three people on there and we uh, talked about a variety of different things. So yeah, thanks man. for coming on. 
I, I like to talk about game collecting. So next time we do that, I'd like to talk to you again. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. And then we have Kingdom Geekdom. That's a really good name. Um, he said, I really enjoyed Star Ocean 4 and was surprised to find a lot of people hating on the game and praising 3, which has its own set of flaws. Glad to hear you guys liked it because it was actually one of the games that got me into JRPGs. Nice podcast. Keep up the good work. I appreciate that. Yeah. I mean, they're fun, but they're flawed, but fun experiences. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I had a good time with Star Ocean 4, so I'm glad I'm not the uh, only one. Yeah. I'm basically kind of saying what he was saying. Especially the PS3 Definitive Edition. So much better than the Xbox 360 version. Really? Like they, they I've played the Xbox 360 stuff. version. It, that's the original one. It was on two discs, um, but the definitive version brought a better UI. I believe it brought an extra character in as a party member, and it added more story content, I believe. Oh. So the PS3 ver- PS3 slash PS4 version is the definitive one by far. Really? I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. I know in Steam right now, I think you can get a PC version of it, and like it offered... Offers you the chance to play it at like 4K and stuff. And <laughs> I've been tempted to buy it uh, on one of the Steam sales, but I haven't yet. So that might be the next definitive version. I don't know. If anyone's played the PC version, let us know. Yeah, if you see it on sale, I recommend it. Grab it. Cool. Um, BioPhoenix says, awesome. Jam Gamecast is a good guy. So far, I've been really liking Octopath and been playing for nine hours at the moment. This was last week, so... I'm sure he's farther along, uh, but he says, and while the story is pretty basic for each character, I really do like the writing for the characters, which I think is important. The battles are quick and fun to figure out. The weaknesses sort of reminds me of an SMT game, which is always great. I also started as Primrose, and yes, the starting area with her alone was a little challenging, but still easy to understand. I do agree with the characters joining in randomly. It's kind of weird. I I like I like. Uh, I still like buying old games, but sadly I have not had much luck in my area. Okay. Well, first off, before he goes into game collecting, um, I don't know. You said you started off Primrose and it was kind of difficult in that area, right? Um, I wouldn't say difficult, but it's, uh, and it's a lot for one character to take on. <laughs> I mean, yeah, gr- granted the level is corresponding with the character and it's definitely more than possible to beat it. It's just mm-hmm. when you're playing the game for the first time, it can feel a little overwhelming. But, you know, uh, I went through it anyways, and it it was just fine. Interesting. Because I started with Alphen, and then Primrose was my second character. So I had a little trouble with that first boss. So I was trying to imagine what this would be like by uh, yourself. But, of course, the leveling uh, scaling is going to be a little different. So, okay. Um, Then he says about the game collecting. I still like buying old games, but sadly, I have not had much luck in my area. Also, I've been saving up for other stuff all year, and as for the whole big YouTubers raising prices, well, I can understand the frustration since I remember I was looking for a Genesis game called El Viento, and a few months later, Happy Console Gamer did a video on it, and then I kept seeing prices going up by a crazy amount, but eventually I waited and I sold the game for a decent price that was affordable, and I got it and I was happy with it. So yeah, moral of the story is, uh, patience is key. Oh, well, great episode. Patience is very key in collecting because you need to compare how much the game was just a few weeks ago to what it is now. If the game was like 50 bucks a few weeks ago and all of a sudden it rose to 200 for some reason, it spiked for some reason, either because there's low stock of the game itself or you um, or like something happened that just made it popular for that week uh, in the collecting community. What I say is you compare for you compare it to a few weeks ago, look at it now, and I say maybe wait maybe at least a week later and see if it starts dropping back down. And if it starts dropping back down, then wait for it to get to that point. But it may be possible that the game there's not much of the game left. Like I spoke last week about Contra, and mm-hmm. Contra was like you could just be able to get Contra for like fifteen, twenty dollars. And because they, at the time, they had such low stock of it, it became a forty to fifty dollar game. Sure. So you just kind of have to play the game a little bit and just like know when is the right time to buy it. I never recommend like an impulse buy. Like if it raises up to two hundred dollars, say from fifty, and you're like, I don't care, but I gotta have it now. It's right here. 
don't recommend that. You're going to burn a hole in your wallet quick if you just keep impulse buying. you got to make sure that you're getting it for the right price. Because if you want to game collect, if you want to collect a lot of stuff, then you really got to be smart with your money. Unless you are just like loaded with money that something like $200 is absolutely nothing to you, then that's fine. But most people who do this as a hobby do not have all the money in the world to spend. Yeah, so... I think before you look at any game, before you look it up, just ask yourself, how much am I willing to spend on this just without knowing anything, going in blind, right? And, you know, if you put a a price tag on it and then you go on there and you see that a game is $200, I don't know, me personally, I don't care what game it is. I'm not spending $200 on that game. I'm just not doing it. Uh, I I don't care. Chrono Trigger, I'm not doing it. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I'm I'm probably just going to play the DS version or I could emulate it. Um, I'm not I'm not paying that much money for that game. Like, that's just you've exceeded the realm of what seems reasonable to me and you've gone absurd. And I'm just not doing it. So uh, it, like BioPhoenix was saying, like, hey, Happy Console Gamer did a video on this. Apparently the price of the game started to spike a lot, but he waited and he got it for a good price. Uh, he didn't go and just buy it immediately at whatever crazy price it was. And uh, that way you don't feel like you got screwed and go watch happy console gamers video. It's probably uh, since you're interested in the game, you know, it's probably a good video to watch. Uh, You can be uh, benefits on both sides here. Uh, So it's, you know, it's not always uh, best to just go in blind and just start purchasing stuff uh, at obscene costs unless, you know, you've done your research and you just absolutely have to have it. So um, I don't know. Yeah. Number one thing, just do your research. Yeah, I don't though. I'm trying to imagine the only time I'd be willing to spend a crazy amount of money like that is maybe if I was trying to do like a collection of a certain game and I only needed one game to complete that collection and I've been searching for years and like and like just never dropped. And I finally I was just like, you know what, whatever it's, you know, got my tax refund or whatever. I'm just going to buy it, complete my collection. I could understand that. But anything outside of that, like. (laughs) <laughs> no, I admittedly have a weakness for Zelda related collectible stuff. I still want sure. to get a sealed uh, ga- Zelda game and watch. Oh, man. Uh, How much device. is that going for? I forgot, but the last time I saw the sealed up version, it may have changed. No, I haven't checked in a long while, but it was like a hundred and around a hundred and fifty dollars for a sealed. Nope. Game and watch it. Zelda, <laughs> which, yeah. which is, uh, I think it is a little high right now, but if I'm feeling luxurious one day, I may get it. Yeah. But that, that price pretty much stays around there for how many times I've checked it. And I've been looking for, admittedly, I do not have a box for my Oracle of Seasons, Legend of Zelda. Mm-hmm. I do have one for my uh, Oracle of Ages, but not Seasons. I don't know what happened to the box. It may have gotten ruined or something back then, but every time I look for it, it's like, it's very hard to get the box by itself. Usually people are selling the game with it yeah, and it's selling for higher than I'm willing to pay for it. Yeah. If they, if that box is ever $40 or below, I think I'll get it. But a lot of times it's higher than that. Yeah. Well, and you know, that type of stuff I can understand too, because you're trying to complete something that you've been looking for, uh, for a long time. But yeah, uh, even me, man, $150, uh, that would be a, and I guess that is for you too, a hard, a hard buy, but, Mm -hmm. um, let's see here. Uh, we got Patrick J. Um, okay. So Patrick J last week, he was talking about, um, how Yoshi P might be working on Final Fantasy 16. And we were kind of given some of our doubts. Um, so he's just kind of friendly response here. Uh, he said to respond to Eric's response to me where he doubted Yoshida directing Final Fantasy 16. I was actually going to mention that I think there's a decent chance Yoshida won't direct 16 himself and only be the producer of it due to overseeing Final Fantasy 14 slash business division five as a whole, which he's the division leader of. Uh, they work on Final Fantasy 14, Dragon Quest, Builders, FF11, the new project, and mobile games. He put that in parentheses, but didn't mention it because the comment was too long already as it was. Um, yeah, I totally get that. It's all, it's all you, you never want to write like a, a long novel and then put it on there. You know, I always feel bad when I do that. Um, but he says that aside, 
As was said, he wouldn't give any indication that he is directing it in interviews before it's announced if he is. Like uh, when Hashimoto, executive producer of Final Fantasy VII Remake and the FF series brand manager, said in 2014, he slash Square Enix had no plans to remake FF7, even though work on the remake had started at that point. It's also possible Yoshi, uh, Yoshida could uh, get a co-director to work with him on Final Fantasy XIV to ease his workload on it while Final Fantasy XIV XVI ramps up. And if we take Yoshida at his word, he said if the company asked him to lead sixteen, he would. It seems very likely they would ask him to do it since all the rest of Square's internal teams that would make it besides his are really busy with completely unreleased AAA games. One with Final Fantasy VII Remake, one with Tabata's new IP, plus 15 DLC, and one with Kingdom Hearts 3. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I know it's kind of directed at Eric, but I'll go ahead and respond real quick. My thoughts. Uh, I think anything's possible. Um, and I do see your logic there that, Hey, all these people, other people are working on other games. So wouldn't it be reasonable that, um, they would ask him cause he's really popular. And I do agree with that. It's just, uh, with me personally, I, I don't even think they're working on 16 right now, to be honest. <laughs> I don't, I don't even think that's in the picture. They just came out with 15. They're doing some more DLC. Uh, the, they're doing seven remake. I think seven remake has kind of taken the slot of Final Fantasy 16. I know that, you know, different teams are working on these games, but, uh, you know, Final Fantasy 16 would be a tremendous money sink for them right now. So I think that, uh, I'm not quite sure that they would be willing to, currently have that money out there just like kind of out in the open uh to have the final fantasy 7 remake funds money where you know however much that budget is right so you have all that money going out then you have all this money going out for 16 uh then you know final fantasy 14's got money going out for it but they're making money at the same time uh you know i'm i don't know maybe maybe i could be wrong but uh yeah i, I mean naoki yoshida is constantly directing slash producing 14 they're always making new content they're in the midst of making next expansions and he's got to oversee the story and he's got to overlook even the smallest detail of the development for these things because mmos are very uh fragile <laughs> little yeah. games that can break easily uh from a single mistake he there's a lot he has to overlook there and and top of that he has to do he has to travel around the world a lot to uh, present ff14 and do interviews and stuff like that like i said last week so it gives me the doubt that he will do it now unless square enix cuts down a lot of his responsibilities for ff14 it's definitely possible he could direct 16 and and but just for how successful 14 is i just have my doubts if that he will do that on the other comment about you said that FF16 is probably not in development. I think you're right on that. I think it's at the, if I had to guess, I think it's at the conceptual stage still. And I think they probably have an idea what they want to make out of FF16. Mm -hmm. But I think they're at the point where they're probably looking for like the right directors, the right producers and to overlook and take over the project before they start development on it. And likely They'll start developing on it after they've gone a good way, a, yeah, um, a good ways into the development of the FF7 remake. If I had to yeah. guess, well, here's what I think that like I think the time schedule for that. I think they would like to have Final Fantasy VII, the first game, come out, the remake, and then in between waiting for the second game from Final Fantasy VII remake, they're going to want to have something to kind of fill that gap. And I think Final Fantasy 16 would be perfect for that. I I would imagine that's what they would plan to do. And if that's the case, that's 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 a ways off because I don't think the seven remakes coming out till 2020 at least. So that means I wouldn't see 16 coming out till 2022 at the very least. Yeah, you know? I, I predict that FF 16 will get announced after Kingdom Hearts three, but before FF seven remake. And that would be a great podcast episode for us because I would be all on top of that stuff. <laughs> so whatever is announced. I mean, um, but, I have my ideal for ideal FF16 that I know would never happen, but, but well, we all do. Me. <laughs> what is it? 
Um, uh, that that is a discussion for another day. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, that, um, I'll, I'll take over an hour just doing that. Okay, cool. <laughs> Uh, so just kind of wrap up here. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's totally possible he's doing it. Um, my only question would be is if square looks at Final fantasy 14 and says, okay, this thing is making us a ton of money. What is the risk of us pulling Yoshi P off this? Like, will we still make as much money? Like what if somebody else comes in and, you know, players start getting upset or whatever, or like they don't like the direction this other person takes it. Um, he would still have to be involved with the project, I think, or at least Square would want him to be at least to keep uh, shareholders happy. So, um, but I yeah, think, dude, it's totally possible he could be working on it at some point. I think Yoshi P would keep his producer role, but he may possibly hand the director role to someone else. If right. So, like, he the got thrown at 16. Yeah. But just maintenance, co- uh, maintenance to somebody else. Yeah. That makes sense. So, um, Patrick, get some more thoughts. Let us know, and uh, we'll definitely uh, correspond with you. But <coughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I always appreciate someone who has good insight inside the uh, business of these companies. So um, you know, we definitely value the the uh, comments that you put in here for sure. Mm-hmm. So, uh, anyways, that kind of wraps up our comments for this week, and uh, that finishes up this episode. Next week, I am going to be out of town, so it's going to be. Unless I somehow come back early, it's going to be Eric rocking this most likely solo. Um, so y'all can look forward to that. I'm sure he's going to have some interesting stuff to talk about. Uh, make sure you ask him lots of difficult questions in the comments and see if he addresses some of those. Um, that way he can feel uh, a lot of pressure to try to answer these big topics by himself. Um, yeah, I think I might just go on a rant for about an hour, an hour. <laughs> he's just like throw us down, a, throw us down his pen or something. He's like, "All right, All right this what is else? what's happening." Yeah, <laughs> what else do I hate? <laughs> <laughs> it's just like well, the final episode of Phoenix Edge. Mm-hmm. Um, so, anyways, uh, y'all can look forward to that next week. But uh, and then I'll obviously be back the uh, following week. And uh, yeah, I think that's all all we got for now. So. Uh, thanks for checking us out and we'll, we'll check you out again next week. Take it easy guys. Take care.